Well, welcome. Uh, it's great to uh, be together again, to worship God, to welcome each other uh, as we fellowship and as we uh, join together in the worship of our great God. It's uh, so exciting uh, in the life of our church to, to see us unfolding out of, uh, out of some uh, harsher restrictions to be able to worship God together. And uh, we want to welcome you uh, to all those who join us online. Uh, we want to particularly welcome those who are a regular part of our church family, but also to those uh, who, for whatever reason, uh, aren't in our location or uh, maybe joining us for the first time. We want to welcome you in particular. And we hope that uh, today will be a, a really great experience for you. Uh, if you'd like to know more about our church or if you'd like to communicate better within our church, please, uh, uh, the ongoing uh, um, offer of uh, downloading our church app. And uh, thanks to the many, many people who have done that. We're getting the, the hang of it now on how to book in for church. Um, uh, last Sunday, we had our first live gathering here at Garrett Street with great joy and great excitement to be in the same space together. And uh, if you feel confident enough that that's something you'd like to do, then uh, you're more than welcome to come. We do have limited spaces, uh, but uh, if you book in uh, through the app primarily, uh, or if you'd like to contact one of us through the, the uh, church website, uh, we'll certainly uh, uh, let you in on how to be able to do that. But thank you to all who are participating uh, either online or uh, here live at Garrett Street and uh, we want to welcome you with great joy today. Also uh, should be aware of uh, our YouTube channel uh, Target on Baptist Church and uh, you need to um, uh, really check out all the, the various uh, resources on that but uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, subscribing to that as a little subscribe button when you uh, uh, go online and that will help us uh, with all kinds of things in terms of numbers and, and how to do things better than we're already doing them. Uh, you would have, uh, if you're a regular part of our church family and on our database, you would have received our draft budget and uh, we hope that you'll go through that and any questions you'll uh, refer to our church treasurer and uh, we, uh, we're just so grateful at uh, your faithfulness in that area and uh, also the skills of our finance team uh, who have put together all of those details for us. Well, we come to worship God together today and uh, we're so glad that we're able to do that um, in song and uh, as we sing together, whatever our context might be, uh, let's lift our voices uh, in praise to God. This first song is a song in which, uh, well, if you're seated, it would be better to stand. It's called 10,000 Reasons. It's called Bless the Lord, O My Soul. <laughs>
Well, what a great way to start our service uh, together in worship. It's great to sing songs that remind us that we can worship God uh, when things are going well, uh, but when things are tough too, uh, we can lean into the strength and uh, the blessings of God. Uh, welcome again. It's great to um, share God's Word with you today. We're looking over this next uh, few weeks at uh, or re-engaging our minds and hearts with what uh, church is all about uh, because our church, as we know it, has been dislocated just like every other church that, that I know and don't know of. Um, and we're seeking to move forward in this um, very difficult but also very um, opportunistic time where we get to, to, to maybe rethink things that uh, we have moved away from uh, because of neglect or a lack of focus. And today we really want to look at the whole subject of, of how you and how I fit together within the body of Christ. Um, somebody was saying to me at a, a shopping centre uh, a little while ago, uh, do you realise that uh, it's uh, about nine weeks to Christmas? And uh, I duly chastened them for reminding me of that because I don't want to think about Christmas in October. But uh, this person said, yeah, it's like uh, 10 weeks. Um, uh, are you starting your Christmas shopping? And uh, that was too much. I had to uh, kind of leave the conversation at that point. Um, but I looked up some statistics, uh, well, actually it was in the newspaper, that last year in 2019, uh, Australians in total spent 18.8%. Eight billion, not million, billion dollars, nearly $20 billion on Christmas gifts alone. So before they ate, before they drank, before they travelled, they spent $20 billion, you and I and everyone in Australia, $20 billion. That worked out to be about nearly $1,000 on gifts alone per household. The scary thing about the article too said that um, Australians were relying mainly on credit to fund that giving. It used to be said that it is the thought that counts, but really, in my experience, it's often the gift that counts. Fundamental in receiving any gift is the use of that gift. The socks we wear, the perfume or cologne we splash on, the, uh, the presents that we open. Um, this year, this is mainly for my family and friends, uh, it's the, uh, the new Callaway driver that you might swing. Gifts are always presented and opened and to be used, to be um, put into the action for which they were de designed. Otherwise, the gift is wasted. And we've been looking at this theme called, Where Do You Belong? Finding Your Fit Within the Body of Christ. And gifts are really part, a big part, of how God wills for us to function as a community of Christ, as a church. But the sad thing is that too many Christians will go to their dying breath without really ever using the gift or the gifts that God has given them through the power of his Holy Spirit for a variety of reasons. The Apostle Paul wrote some words to the church at Corinth because he didn't want them to be ignorant about spiritual gifts because for them it was a new kind of concept to not just summon up your own strength and your own talents but a new concept that God would give you something that you otherwise wouldn't have through the power of his spirit and as a result of following after the Lord Jesus Christ and so he wrote to them now about spiritual gifts or gifts of the spirit brothers and sisters I don't want you to be ignorant I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be sketchy or hazy or foggy on what these spiritual gifts are all about. In other words, we all have a gift. All of us have at least one. We have a spiritual gift that is infinitely greater than anything you'll ever get at Christmas or on your birthday, even if you get a Callaway driver. Spiritual gifts are from the very grace of God. And they are for us to identify and cherish and use. And we have a responsibility for the gifts that God has given us. Just like last week we talked about carrying our own load. You remember with a backpack. We have a responsibility to discover the gifts that God has given to us spiritually and to put them into play in this community called the church. And for us to use them is both critical to our own destiny and purpose but also to the flourishing and to the health of the community of God we call the church. And to go through life having been given a gift from God and to not even unwrap it and use it 
is just unthinkable. So we're focusing on where do we belong? Where do we fit? Because God doesn't just call you to go to church. He calls you to serve in his community. So he doesn't want us to be ignorant about that. So I thought for a, a few minutes we'd look at what it is that God has created and called us to do. This is not an exhaustive message on all the dynamics of the gifts of the Spirit, but it might be a, a prod to you that you might read more about it, you might think more about it, pray more about it, receive and exercise the gifts that God has given to you. The first thing is that we are indeed called to serve. For even the Son of Man, says Jesus, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Right at the heart of the mission and practice of Jesus Christ, the one we follow, is this mission to serve. Now, that is a revolutionary thought, both in the day that it was first said and even in this day and age. The Apostle Paul wrote much about the, the gifts of the Spirit and how they fit into the context of the church. And he wrote to the church at Ephesus uh, these words about serving. He said, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So you and I were made, created, shaped, saved to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So again, just like love, this is no passive thing that we simply get a gift and play with it, but it is to put into practice so that not only we might flourish, but the body of Christ may be all that it was called and created to be. Very often in our age, we hear this term called the bucket list. I uh, am at an age now where I go to uh, a lot of kind of gatherings, I suppose, where people have a, a bucket list and they have all these things that they want to do. Uh, maybe because they can afford them now and uh, they couldn't afford them when they were a bit younger and, and now they're, they've got this bucket list and it, it's full of all kinds of things, of, of travel and purchasing and doing stuff they haven't done before and um, it's an interesting kind of list that people have. Uh, actually, th the idea of a bucket list, uh, we get this idea of, um, it comes from basically a saying called kick the bucket um, and I, I'm a bit of a, a student of words. I like to know the etymology of words, where they come from, about sayings and, and various uh, that sort of thing and in the Oxford English Dictionary, um, it gives us an explanation of this saying, kick the bucket. Um, it was actually a reference to when a pig was in its death throes um, and uh, I won't give you all the gory details but when it actually was put to death, it would actually kick a bucket and it would be uh, killed. Um, well, I want to tell you some good news about kicking the bucket. In Christ, you won't. Your end of your mortal life will certainly happen but it will really only be uh, the end of the beginning for you because we believe that we are eternally in Christ. We believe that we are able to do more through him and with him than we otherwise could do for ourselves. The real list that matters is not the trips we take or the places we visit or the planes we jump out of or whatever is on your list, but it is the service we offer and the lives that we get to have influence in through the wonderful manifestation of the Spirit of God. God has made you specifically able to do that in a unique way, using all of your personality, all who you are, and gifting you in such a way that you otherwise wouldn't have been gifted. God calls us to serve. The Apostle Peter wrote this. He said, but you, that is you in the, the body of Christ, you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for a high calling of priestly work. Just note that word. Chosen to be a holy people, God's instrument to do his work. Now, I don't know what comes to your mind when you uh, hear those words, priestly work. Um, sadly, the images are not always very good. But in the ancient world, priests were not just like clergy would be today or even priests are today. Back then, there was no separation between church and state. And even the leaders of state and government were, and people of power were also referred to as priests. Julius Caesar, for instance, was not just Caesar, Julius, but he was Julius Caesar, also known as Pontifus Maximus. In other words, the, the most high priest. Priest was a title of transcendence and dignity and majesty. 
And uh, in Israel, as well as there has been since, there was a kind of a two-tier system and a two-track system. There was the kind of the regular people, they were known as the laity, and then there was the, the priest track, and they were kind of the, the holy people. Uh, there was a holy place where only priests would go. There was a, a holy prayers that only priests could say, sacrifices that only priests could sacrifice and offer. There was a whole system around clothing. There were some clothes that only priests could wear. There was only forgiveness that priests could offer. Then Jesus came along and he changes everything. He blows that two-track system just out of the water. He gives himself as an ultimate sacrifice upon the cross for our forgiveness and we'll celebrate that a bit later in communion. And what priests had been pointing towards, Jesus ultimately and completely and finally did. In Hebrews 4, we're told that, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who was ascended into heaven, that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. You see, we might think that that would be the end of the priesthood, but it wasn't. In Christ, it actually became the end of the laity. That we are what is now known as the priesthood, of all believers. But you are the ones, says the Apostle Peter, the ones chosen by God to the high calling of priestly work. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Now this became known as, as I said, the priesthood of all believers and many centuries before even Martin Luther nailed his thesis on a wall um, and first drew breath, the Apostle Paul was reminding those who were in Christ of who they were in him. In other words, there would be no more two-tier system. There would no more be professionals and amateurs, priests and non-priests. The result was that wasn't that there was no more clergy, the result was that now there is no more laity, that we all have a priestly work to do. You know, the word minister was never used in the early church, at least not by church, uh, not least for a group of leaders. Minister came from a word used for waiting on tables and service. Everybody was to be called a minister. That's why in our church, when we list who's the minister, we say everyone. And we list who the pastor is and at the moment. That'd be me. Nobody is in the stands, everybody is in the game. Nobody is the amateur, no one is the professional. We are all part of this priesthood of all believers. Belonging begins with serving and serving enables us to belong. We're going to sing a great song together. It's a song that um, is old in its language but very current in its message. It's a dangerous song to sing. It's really a prayer. It's asking God to take who we are and to use us for his purpose. So let's sing together, Take My Life.
some challenging thoughts in that uh, little video, eh? Um, we get this one life and uh, we want to make it count. Um, we've been talking about where do we belong, where do we fit within the body of Christ, this community that Jesus established that uh, we call the church and uh, how it is that the gifts that God has given actually are part of the plan of God. As crazy as it seems, as at times as dysfunctional as that might look, that God's plan is that people like me and people like you and people nothing like me and nothing like you would be part of this community that would turn the world upside down, that would be of influence in the world in which they live. And that would be done by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that it would be organised around those gifts. And so we want to talk about that for a, a few moments' time and then together we're going to celebrate and join in uh, communion and, uh, and then together we'll be able to uh, re-establish in our own hearts why it is that we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the first thing I, I want to say about this is that God has gifted you. Sometimes in life we think that, uh, well, maybe I was holding the, the door when all the gifts were um, kind of handed out by God. And, uh, but you weren't. If you are a follower of Christ, if the Holy Spirit is deposited within you, then you have at least one gift 
that is from God, a spiritual gift, a purposeful gift, a gift that is not just yours to enjoy, not just yours to open and play with, but in fact yours to do a great purpose with. The Bible tells us that to each person has been given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So when gifts were given out, and they're still given out, they were given so that they might benefit not just one who is receiving that gift, but for the common good. Now in the context of the community that is called the church, it means that any community will not function as God has ordained it to function unless all the parts of that body are functioning in the gifts that God has given it. Now, I know that seems like a utopian dream, but that is certainly the ideal that we head towards as a local church. The Holy Spirit has given you and I at least one spiritual gift. And again, we have a responsibility to accept and discover those gifts and to find a place that we can express those gifts in the local church. This is God's plan. He doesn't have a plan B for the church. This is God's plan. It has always been God's plan that to be led by people who have the spiritual gift of leadership, to be shepherded by those who have the spiritual gift of shepherding, to be um, uh, taught by people who have the spiritual gift of teaching. But that doesn't mean they're the only gifts. The church doesn't function unless people with the teaching or sorry, the, uh, the spiritual gift of helps, if they don't help, uh, those who have a spiritual gift of, of kind of administration and organisation, uh, if they don't do their job, then everything descends into a, a kind of a chaotic mess. God has gifted you and this is God's plan for the church where everyone is a servant, everyone is about the priestly work of the kingdom of God, where everyone belongs. But sadly, here's what happens. Over time, churches, including ours, can slip back into this two-track system. And this would ebb and flow over the centuries of the church. In our period of church history, the common idea would be that a bunch of people, a bunch of Christ followers might get together and they would form a community, a church. And then they would do something quite bizarre. They would think to themselves, we'll employ a minister. And this is the language they would use. And what would the minister do? Well, he, and in those days it was mainly a he, well, he would do the ministry. He would study the Bible and preach and visit shut-ins and pray for the sick and minister to other leaders and shepherd the flock and print the bulletin and recruit the volunteers and he would marry and bury and comfort and counsel and console. He would be a master of theology and exegesis and homiletics and leadership and administration and finance and management and worship arts. It would kind of be like a badge of honour if the minister would end up in a kind of special facility for the ministry insane. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is that everyone who calls and adheres to following Jesus Christ who has repented of this sin and follows them, follows him, is gifted with at least one spiritual gift. Again, not for their own use, but for the use of the common good. To each has been given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So God has gifted you. Never think that you are the only one who has missed out, because you haven't. Find out what your spiritual gift is. Talk to me or somebody else and we can lead you through uh, a period of time or pray with you so that you can discover that gift and see where it is that you might fit in the local church. Another aspect of service is that God uses us when we serve. Now, when I say the word uses, I mean use us in our purpose, not use us in a, in a kind of a, uh, a bad way of the sense of the word. Paul uh, wrote to the church and um, articulated this concept or this metaphor of the body of Christ or the presence of Christ. And in that, he would say to those um, exactly what it would mean uh, to be part of a body. And he would use body language. Um, he would say that the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. This is a little bit of a warning. If you are a Christ follower and you think that you are an island 
that you are an independent operator or a freelance contractor as a Christian, I want to tell you, I want to encourage you to read and reread the New Testament because I can't find any expression of Christianity outside the context of community. Now, I know that at times churches suck. I've led them and been part of them. I know that sometimes they can be toxic and even abusive places. Well, my encouragement to you would be to find a church in which the Word of God is expounded accurately and regularly, a place where you are accepted, but also that you are allowed to participate in the body of Christ, that you move from being a spectator to a contributor. Paul goes on to talk about the deep implications of us needing one another. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and so on. I've never heard anybody say, listen, I've got a terrible headache today, but my back feels great. You know? Part affects another part. When something bad happens in the body of Christ, we all suffer. When something great happens, we all rejoice. That's part of the wonderful thing of gathering together, either online at the moment, I guess, but also here at Garrett Street. We are part of the body of Christ and there are no useless or superfluous body parts. When people with gifts of help help, when those with gifts of encouragement encourage, when shepherds shepherd, then the body of Christ is built up and functions as God has wanted it to be. But when all of that doesn't happen, the church doesn't function as it otherwise could or should. And its influence in the world and the community in which it is placed is sorely diminished. Some years ago I read uh, the writings of a a great author called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've talked about him uh, time and time again. And he wrote a a wonderful little book called um, Together and uh, or Life Together. And in it he said a whole bunch of things about community which were very helpful. But I was interested in this. He said, thus it is a good idea for all members, he's talking about the church, to receive a definite task to perform for the community so that they may know in times of doubt that they are too not useless and incapable of doing anything. He goes on to say that every Christian community must know that not only does it exist do the weak need the strong, but also the strong cannot exist without the weak. And then he says this interesting sentence, the elimination of the weak is the death of the community. That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? The elimination of the weak is the death of the community. No matter what people see on this earth or don't see, no matter what people applaud or don't applaud, our servanthood, our service will be part of God's pleasure and divine delight in our life. So God has created you to serve. God has gifted you to serve. God uses you when you serve because you belong to the body of Christ. Now, if you're going to have a wild stab at what the application of all of this might lead us to, well, it's really in one word, and that is the word serve. Find your place of belonging in the body of Christ and serve. Find where you fit in the body of Christ and serve. And serve and serve again. Jesus Christ didn't come to be served but to serve. And his followers are servants of him. In a few moments time we're going to have communion together. We're going to do that because we believe it's important in this season to be constantly more um, reminded of the crux of our faith, the day that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for our sins. We're going to sing together and hear a song sung for us that simply says, I come to the altar. I want you to really take in these words and sing along with them because they will orientate your heart, I believe, into that space that you might like to take communion. If you haven't already prepared, you might like to get a piece of bread and some juice and then after the song, we'll take communion together.
Let's sing together. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Jesus Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves, that he dealt with our sin once and for all on a cross. Let's eat this bread remembering his body that was broken.
Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And he served us as our servant king. His blood was shed upon the cross so that we might know that God has demonstrated his love toward us. So let's drink in remembrance of him who died for our sins. Let's proclaim his death until he comes. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness, not just in our salvation, but indeed the giving of gifts so that we might have a new purpose in this world. We died a death to our old selves and took on Christ and the new life in him. So we thank you for that. Forgive us, Lord, when we have gifts that we have unopened or we've had gifts that we've laid aside help us today to be reminded that we have priestly work to do that we are to be your instrument to do your work in this world I ask your blessing upon each and every one and ask that you might continue to help us serve you serve each other and serve in this world in which you have placed us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you and we look forward to uh, gathering with you again uh, the next time that we are able to worship and fellowship together. God bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you all the days of your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>